Hello and welcome to another episode of Jabra's Gospel Thoughts and more Old Testament. And now the anticipated, as long as I've been anticipating, the third part about David as king. So in the first two parts, we talked about the rise of David, we talked about the years of David, the fugitive. Now Saul is dead and that's where the reign of David starts. But David's reign doesn't start easily. He's not just handed keys to the kingdom because Saul is dead. Um, several things happened, as you remember. Saul gave Michal, his, uh, David's wife, to another man to be a wife, and that sort of severs the, right, the connection that would have allowed David to succeed Saul. And the other obstacle is that Saul has sons, direct sons, who are around, which makes it hard for David to assert his right to the kingdom, even though uh, the people love him, everyone loves him, he has the support of Michal, he had the support of Jonathan. This is still not enough. That's not how it works in tribal cultures. The sons of the dead king are the ones who rightfully rule. So the, this book of 2 Samuel is really the book of David because David is, uh, Samuel isn't there and there is another prophet, his name is Nathan, who will come later in the picture in a very important part of the story. But David, David this, this book is all about David the king from the beginning of his reign the birth pangs of his reign, if you, if you want, and until to the moment he is like in the waning years of his kingdom. So, and it will go in sort of an arc. The arc takes the form of David having struggles, he overcomes obstacles, he establishes his kingdom, and then David... Uh, David commits a sin, or before that, David becomes king, he, he has success, everything is secure, and then David commits a sin, and after he commits that sin, everything starts going downhill, sort of. Even with his repentance, uh, the sin he commits has consequences. So that's kind of the arc that this story will, will take with him. Now, Let's start with this, and I'm, I'm going to go chapter by chapter really quick and stop where there are worthy points to stop. So we will start in chapter 1, and that's where David learns about the death of Saul. If you remember, Saul and Jonathan died, and there are different accounts of how Saul died, but this Amalekite, uh, this Amalekite comes into David, carrying the news, with the news that Saul is dead, he has taken the sword of the king, he has the head of Saul, and David is distressed, and he says this poem, express, expressing his sorrow for Jonathan, expressing his sorrow for David, for, uh, for uh, Saul, and, uh, and then he basically kills the Amalekite, who brings him the news. If you remember, I spoke about this before, the Amalekites, it's a mitzvah, it's a commandment to first, not to forget what the Amalekites did when the Jews were trying to enter Palestine, to enter the Holy Land, and also to avenge, uh, to ex uh, exact vengeance on the Amalekites. These two are commandments. So David has no problem killing the Amalekite. First, he's a hated, a, it's a hated nation amongst the Jews, so, and he's bringing him news about the death of Saul, and so he kills the Amalekite. But uh, he, uh, it's really interesting in verse 17 of chapter 1, and David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. Uh, the beauty of Israel is slain, and he, it's it's really a beautiful uh, a beautiful uh, poem. And like the Psalms, it's David was really a good poet. So chapter two, David now is anointed king over the house of Judah. So 
David is from the house of Judah. He is from one tribe amongst 11. But the rule is still in Saul's family. He's a Benjaminite. So there is this guy whose name is Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth, who is son of Saul, becomes king of the rest of Israel. And Ishbosheth, the word Ish in Hebrew means man. Bosheth means shame. So he is a man of shame. And he is, as you can read in the story, he is a weak, he is a weak king. And Really, his strength is uh, is this man who's his, this military commander whose name is Abner. Ab means uh, my father is Ner, and Ner means light. So uh, David is trying to establish establish his rule, but uh, that's that's not working. And because Esposheth is in the picture, and Abner is a capable military leader, and the two armies in chapter two clash. The David's army and Esposheth's army clash. Esposheth's army is defeated, and Abner, uh, Abner runs away. And chasing after Abner is this man whose name is Asahel, and Asahel is. Uh, is persistent he doesn't stop chasing Abner and Abner is telling him just leave me alone just leave me alone and Asahel apparently is not a he's uh, in verse 18 chapter 2 it says Asahel was as light of foot as a wild draw he was just light in his feet he was fast and uh, but probably as weak as a wild draw too when when facing a lion and so Joab keeps warning him, and he tells him, I'll kill you. I don't want to kill you. In verse 22, uh, he says, And Abner said again to Asahel, Turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? So Joab is the leader of David's armies. And in those tribal relationships, you, you once you kill someone's brother, uh, there is this revenge against you. There is this vengeance that has to be exacted. It has to be executed. Yeah, you have to die if you kill my brother. That's how tribal rule works. And uh, Abner doesn't want to get into that. He doesn't want to have that blood on his hands. What Asahel insists, and uh, Abner kills him. And so now there is this blood feud between Abner and Joab. And... Uh, so in chapter 3, the houses of David and Saul engage in long war. Now, if you remember, David uh, swore an oath or gave his word to both, uh, to both Saul and Jonathan that he will preserve their seed. So David is hesitant to murder or kill or cause harm to any of Saul's or Jonathan's posterity. But as we will see in the stories, that's all that seems to happen with Saul's male heirs, uh, at least. So there was this long war, and it's it, some people estimate it, it took about uh, five years. And during that war, in verse 1, chapter 3, David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Long wars tend to do that to you. Whoever has David, remember, is this man who's used to running away. He's built a lot of following. He's been traveling around. He's been a fugitive, but he's been marrying all these women. Uh, not just, and I doubt that uh, sexual pleasure or love was the motive for these marriages. These are marriages that are designed to strengthen your tribal affiliations, your the loyalties of other tribes. And so David is gathering strength. The house of Saul, Saul is dead. Ishbosheth is, is a weak king. And uh, he's so weak, in fact, that Abner uh, takes uh, one of Saul's concubines. Her, and in verse 7, chapter 3, her name was Rizpha. And he takes he goes into Rezfa and Ishbosheth gets angry. And then there is this uh, exchange in verse 8, chapter 3, between Abner and Ishbosheth. And that is the beginning of the separation. Abner is basically thinking, I'm keeping the house of Saul together. 
Ishbosheth is weak, but I'm keeping him in out of loyalty to the house of Saul. And Ishbosheth now is angry with me for taking a concubine, uh, one of Saul's concubines. And then was Abner very wroth at the words of Ishbosheth. And just Ishbosheth asked him in verse 7, he says, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? So Ishbosheth says, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do shew kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father, to his brethren and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman? And so basically in plain English he's saying, I deserve this woman, I've been keeping you alive, I've been preserving you, uh, so why are you asking me this? So do God to Abner, and more also, except as the Lord hath sworn to David, even so I do to him. Uh, so to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul, and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, and uh, from Dan even to Beersheba. So that's what Abner commits to, that he will abandon Ishbosheth and he will uh, help David be king of Israel. And he could not answer, so Ishbosheth could not answer Abner a word again because he feared him. Ishbosheth was weak. And that's what ends up happening in chapter 4. Uh, Two of Saul's captains uh, slay Ishbosheth. There's this uh, mutiny revolt. They take his head to David, who has them slain for killing a righteous person. So that's chapter four. And so, uh, so yeah, so David wins, but the whole point of the story is to show that David was loyal to Saul and Saul's house. So he is exacting revenge upon the people who kill the king. David does not like, is not for the idea of starting his reign, starting his power by killing a king or a righteous person, uh, because that will set a precedent and it will be bad for him. But before that, what happened is Joab hears about, uh, in, in chapter 3 again, I forgot to mention this, uh, Abner returns to, to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Joab doesn't care. Joab just goes and kills and uh, kills Abner. Even though now Abner is helping David, Joab kills Abner. And so that, that feud is done. And Job doesn't get really much of a consequence because uh, David understands that. This is, this is how tribalism works, at least in the Near East ancient and until very recently in the modern Near East. So, uh, yeah, so in verse, in, in chapter 5, all Israel anoints David king. So David now is king, and he was, as in verse 4 we read, he was 30 years old. So in in uh, in that culture, 30 is, remember the Savior was 30 when when he received his calling, when he started his, his work. 30 is the age of mature men. 30 is the age when people start taking, serious, taking you seriously. That's when you're a grown-up. And it says that he reigned for 40 years, so 70. He, he reigned until he was 70. Again, the magic number 7 and the magic number 70. So, uh, and then his rule, and again we're in chapter 5, verse 11, his rule becomes established and a very important alliance between him and Hiram, king of Tyre, is established. And the Haram king of Tyre is going to be very important for the building of the of the Solomon's temple, uh, of the first temple. And uh, then verse 13, David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he came out of Hebron. Now what happened in chapter 5 is there was this town it, uh, called Jerusalem. We've encountered it before, but at that point, it was sort of this sore 
uh, in the throat of, of Israel because it was located in the lands of Benjamin Saul's, Saul's tribe and nobody could take it. The Jebusites were very proud and David manages to take Jerusalem and what he does is after he takes Jerusalem he uh, takes wives out of Jerusalem and to build an alliance to, to have these ties with the Jebusites, the people who are living there and to strengthen his rule further. That's how they did it in those days. And then David establishes the status of Jerusalem even further by taking the ark the, uh, out of the city of da uh, to the city of David, to Jerusalem. He puts the ark in uh, and uh, Meshkin and the tent and all of that, the tabernacle. He takes it and he establish, establishes Jerusalem as his capital and as a holy city. And that's where the whole status of Jerusalem as a holy city starts, the city of David. And this, that's why this point, chapter 6 in the scriptures, is uh, really important. Of course, there is this scene where the ark is being taken uh, to the city to the to Jerusalem and two things happen one of them is uh, this man his name is Azza is smitten because he tries to steady the ark and then there is an incident with Michal Saul's daughter David's wife so we've all read the story about Azza trying to steady the ark and my take on it has always been Azza Azza's heart was in the right place uh, Azza should not have touched the ark because he knew that was not his responsibility, that was not his place. He could have shouted, alerted, cried for help, talked to the people uh, who were responsible for steadying the ark and had more trust in the Lord. And sometimes in in the modern church, we we must understand this. We take this to we take this story to mean that we need we we shouldn't study the ark. If we see something that we think is wrong, or if we're inspired and we think that something is wrong, we shouldn't say anything and just at all be negative about it. That's not what the story is about. Azar should have alerted, should have went to the people and just told them he should have could have shouted could have done any of a hundred number a hundred things to change the situation but he chose to touch what he shouldn't touch and that was his sin his heart was in the right place so he dies and then Michal uh, sees David dancing and dancing and Middle Eastern men I mean Middle East we dance Middle Eastern men dance love dancing but it's not a dignified activity in some parts of the near east of the middle east it's uh, it's not considered dignified and michael being the daughter of the king so david and he's dancing and uh, david doesn't come from a royal family and she she looked down on him and michael at that point is probably also bitter her siblings are dying uh, uh, Ishbosheth has been killed. Uh, her dad is, her father is not around. So she's feeling bitter and angry at David, and she's losing some of some of that love that she had for him. Now uh, the Jewish hachams, the Jewish teachers, sages, always said that uh, because of this friction between. David and, uh, and I'm just quoting the Jewish uh, uh, Publication Society's commentary on the Tanakh and the Old Testament. They say that she, he did not have any relations with her after that, and that's why David and Michal never had children, which severed that relationship between the house of David and the house of Saul forever. Um, and uh, that is that's that's very interesting uh, so yeah so the house of Saul is done because if you remember uh, Samuel when Sh Saul was uh, was he offered sacrifices without permission he went and consulted uh, went and consulted a witch basically he told him you and your family and your children, you'll be no more. 
And so that's, David could not have any children with Michal. So that's, that's this part. Now, chapter 7. And chapter 7 is also very interesting because David, the shepherd, uh, who's been made king totally by the power and grace and help of the Lord. And that is what I learned from the life of David. David's success from A to Z, from the beginning of his life to the end of his life, had very little to do with him and everything to do with the Lord choosing him. And that's what we learn from David. So he, and he acknowledges it, this. He's humble. He acknowledges it. He knows it. When we read the Psalms, we'll see all kinds of places where that is the number one dominant theme of the Psalms, that the Lord is the source of power. And that's why we should only worship the Lord. But David now wants to build a, a house for the Lord. And the prophet Nathan shows up out of nowhere. This is the first we hear of him. And for, at first he approves the plan, but then he, the Lord tells him, No, uh, I don't, I, David wants to build me a house. Remember where, David, remember where you came from. I will build you a house. I, the Lord, will build you the house. You're not going to uh, build me a house. So that is, that, that is a, a very profound point here. We, David's heart, again, is in the right place, like Uzzah's heart was in the right place, but he's trying to do something out of time, not in the Lord's time, and not according to the Lord's planning. He's wanting to have control over that timeline. Uh, and the Lord tells him, no, now is not the right moment for this. Uh, your son will do this. You will not do this. So that is that is another interesting part of the story. So in chapter 8, it tells us in the heading, and that is actually a very good summary of chapter 8, which he defeats his, and subjects many nations. The Lord is with him. The Lord is with him. This is David's life. The Lord is with him. He executes judgment and justice unto all his people unto all his people. And so David now is secure. So chapter 9 is very important. There is this character, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is, is, is a lame son of Jonathan. And, Jonathan. and David wants to honor the house of Saul. He wants to honor the house of Jonathan. So he finds, uh, he finds Saul's grandson gives him property, tells him, you will dine with me, you will be with me, you'll be one of the people who will come and eat with the king, which is a huge honor, and he, by by doing this, he honors his uh, agreement with Jonathan and Saul. Now, uh, there is chapter 10, there is war with the Ammonites, remember, the Ammonites are uh, one of those nations that uh, David hates, but there is war, and that the reason this chapter is here. So remember, remember there is this. You know, David now has established his kingdom, but now we have this chapter about war with the Ammonites and the Syrians. So there is war, and that's a setup for chapter eleven, which is the story of David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba is the daughter of Sheba, and Sheba means seven which again is a holy number, but she is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. He's one of the uh, mercenary warriors who fight for David, very loyal soldier. And we all know the story of David and Bath, uh, Bathsheba. Uh, so David sees her, lusts after her, gets her to his house, lays with her, commits sin. And then, to cover for his crimes, he tries to make, brings Uriah from war, tries to make Uriah uh, go home. Uriah is a loyal soldier. He wouldn't as, and that tells me, what Uriah does next tells me a lot about his character. Uriah does not want to go home and enjoy life when his soldiers are in battle. That's what every great leader does, every amazing leader does. 
you do not so there is this amazing example of leadership as opposed to David's poor example of leadership in this case and uh, he just stays at the door of the king David tries to get him drunk to get him intoxicated but it doesn't work and so he uh, David has Joab send Uriah to the front lines of the front lines to the most dangerous parts and he gets killed and as soon as he gets killed he brings Bathsheba in and makes her his wife which is very interesting because in that culture it would have been, for people who didn't know what was going on they would have said wow look David is honoring Uriah by taking his wife by building his house by taking care of his wife it would have been interpreted as a noble act if one didn't know what happened before it so there is this heinous act that is uh, sort of uh, uh, sugar-coated in the form of a noble act but that it was far from so Nathan Nathan shows up and he tells he tells uh, David the parable about the sheep that a man raised as one of his family actually in verse 3 chapter 12 the word of the words that he uses he says uh, the sheep did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter and so Nathan is using this and you got to love the poetic sense in Hebrew uh, he uses the word daughter which in Hebrew is bat and so he's hinting hint hint David bat as in Bathsheba but David doesn't get it and he issues a judgment against himself and that leads to verse 10 which starts this downhill cycle in David's career and life now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife so not only have you committed adultery with her not only have you uh, uh, have you killed her husband now you've taken her to wife you you basically it was for robbery and um, and David in chapter 13 it's it's how acknowledgement of sin should be unlike Saul who responds in long words and long sentences and phrases when the Lord accuses him or tells him that he has sinned, David's words are very short. He says, unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And that was it. I have sinned against the Lord. Uh, and Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. So the Lord still loves David. The Lord confesses his sin. And sometimes, most of the time, I think all the time, the Lord wants us to just say Lord I have sinned don't offer justifications don't offer reasons don't uh, try to justify it just say I have sinned acknowledging that we have sinned which is in our in, when we teach the gospel to others and teach them about repentance we teach that you have to acknowledge that you have made a mistake that's the first step you have to acknowledge that what you did was a sin and if you don't understand that what you did is sin you can't move on to the next step which is saying I repent I will not repeat it uh, or the part where I will I will uh, uh, recompense the parties that I sinned against you have to understand that you sinned and why it's a sin that is an, a crucial state uh, a crucial part of the repentance process and, and that's why the Lord spares him but he doesn't uh, he doesn't spare him the consequences which is the child that what Sheba is pregnant with will die and of course the consequences also that will follow in the next chapters so uh, the, his child with Bathsheba die and David is very sad but the day the child uh, the child uh, dies David basically arises so David is sad he fasts he does all of the ceremonies associated with repentance and sadness and once the child dies he, he is happy and uh, 
and washes himself and eats and he's restored and he probably thought well that was the price but that's not the the price really because what happens next in chapter 13 is that as Nathan told him his household starts disintegrating uh, and what triggers it again is sexual sin Amnon uh, it says and I wish uh, in our version of the New King James Version, in our edition of the King James Version, we change this word loves, Tamar, his sister, because the Hebrew sense of the word, surely it, it, it means love, but in the context it means lusted. He lusted Amnon, one of his sons, lusts after Tamar, his sister or half-sister, and by artifice, by trickery, forces her, and he is slain by Absalom's command, and Absalom flees to Geshar. So Absalom is her full brother. So again, we know the story. No reason to go into it in all gory details. But uh, he uh, commits Amnon commits incest. Uh, David fails utterly in his responsibility as a father and king in instituting justice uh, for Absalom or for Tamar. And he lets Amnon go scotch free. And so Absalom takes the law in his own hands and he kills Amnon. So again, David loses another son. And, uh, and then in uh, chapter 14, Joab arranges for... Now Joab is acting in all of these stories as kind of a henchman. So Joab arranges by Artemis to bring Absalom home after three years. And so David loves Absalom. And so the rest of the people apparently love Absalom. He was a dashing figure, so to speak. In verse 25 of chapter 14, it says, But in all Israel there was none to be much, so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. So it was like this perfect looking person and looks mattered a lot in ancient in ancient times people in Egypt and Babylonia that's where makeup came from uh, people cared a lot about looks and apparently Absalom was just a naturally handsome uh, fellow so uh, so he had a certain kind of attraction he had the looks of a king and he's the son of a king now Absalom, of course, in chapter 15, conspires against his father. So now David is about to lose another son. And all of these events are, are connected. And I think, I always, when I think about the sin with Bathsheba and how it connects with all of these consequences, the answer is simple. When you are in a sinful mindset when you are occupied with sin, when you are lusting after something you shouldn't lust after, when you are not obeying the commandments, your thinking, your judgment isn't, isn't in the right place. And so you're not paying attention to your family, you're not paying attention to your children, you're not uh, raising them correctly, the, your ethics, your morals, what you're conveying to them. Children see all of these things. And since all of us love our parents, we seek to emulate them even when they are doing bad things. And I think that was the situation. Bathsheba and David were just the, the climax of a, of, of a whole series of failures in family life that preceded that. And you can imagine that probably has been the case in David's life. Someone who's a fugitive on the run, waging many wars, trying to establish a political kingdom, busy with his establishing himself, forgetting about his family. I think I think that's what's happening. And Absalom, Amnon are, are an example of, of what can happen here. So Absalom, uh, again, leads a revolt against his father. But Absalom is, uh, and, and Absalom is almost successful. He actually, David flees in the face of Absalom. Again, David as king, not in his best judgment, not in his best leadership, not in his best strength. He flees with his troops, but he leaves the concubines and the wives. And Absalom comes in and he is advised to go into his father's concubines and wives 
again breaking a major mitzvah, a major commandment in Judaism, which is you shall not uncover thy father's nakedness, which is basically not having any relations with your father's wives. Uh, so uh, Absalom does that, and Mishbosheth, uh, Mephib I'm sorry, Mephibosheth, uh, Saul's son, who was honored by David, kind of joins in the in the rebellion against him. Uh, but David, David now probably this humiliation by his own son is kind of good for him. It, it drives him on the run, and uh, he ends up. His armies end up defeating, uh, defeating uh, Absalom's armies. Um, so now we're in chapter 18. David, when David has the upper hand, he commands the leaders of his army not uh, to harm Absalom, to bring him back safely. David loves Absalom, but Joab, uh, who again is. Uh, is sort of a henchman in, in the stories. He slays Absalom. Uh, Absalom is in a, is in a, he's running away. His head is, is attached to a tree. He can't move. And for some reason, nobody removes him. He has no one with him. And Absalom sends his servants and they kill, uh, they kill Absalom and bury him. And it's very interesting in verse, in chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, but I read 18, Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar because he had no sons, he had no heirs, uh, which is in the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And it is called unto this day Absalom's place. It's, it's a place outside of uh, Jerusalem, 66, 66 feet high Absalom's pillar. If you've ever been there, you've probably been to it. But uh, that's, that's what happened uh, with Near Eastern kings, especially that period you always were focused on an heir, that you needed to leave a name. And Absalom built something like a pyramid to himself, a pillar. 66 feet isn't, isn't too bad. So uh, David, hears about, David hears about Absalom's death. He mourns him uh, by saying the tender words in verse 33, My son, O oh my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh Absalom, my son, my son. It, he is just devastated. And Joab rebukes him in chapter 19, uh, and, the, and David returns as king once again to Jordan, probably humbled, uh, weakened, uh, and never the same after that. And uh, there is more rebellion in chapter 20 against him. But, uh, you know, David is, is always victorious. Then uh, there is a story in chapter 21, which is weird. Uh, David actually, remember again, we go back to this covenant between David and Saul. To preserve his sons, to not cut him off the earth, etc. The Lord sends a famine, and this part I do not understand. But David understands it's this is chapter 21, understands it because Saul smote the Gibeonites contrary to the oath of Israel. David delivers up seven sons of Saul to be hanged by the Gibeonites. Israel and the Philistines continue their war. So there is war, and there is this treaty between the Gibeonites and and Saul that Saul didn't honor and so the solution apparently is to resolve it by killing seven of Saul's sons which I don't know it's it's a strange story given that David made a promise but maybe this is trying to justify David breaking the promise by saying the, that was the Lord's solution. This has always been a mysterious part. This is one of those Old Testament parts that kind of baffles me when I when I uh, get into it. 
Uh, then uh, chapter 22, David praises the Lord. We'll, we're going to have a chance to read, uh, go through 153 Psalms or review them. So I'm not going to dwell on any Psalms or poetry other than to say the main theme in David's poems and Psalms is that God is in command. We have to worship the Lord. He will always be the one to save us. And then chapter 23, uh, I like, I like the heading to it in, in our edition of the King James. It says, David spoke by the power of the Holy Ghost. Rulers must be just ruling in the fear of God. David's mighty men are named and their deeds extolled. So, uh, which is kind of ironic because we're, we're saying here that rulers must be just ruling in the fear of God. But then uh, we're numbering all of these mighty men who mighty as they were they are not the reason that david is king it is the lord who is establishing him and then david again which again he, to emphasize the importance and of the idea that the lord is the source of the strength of israel in judaism it's prohibited that you count you basically the way you count the population of israelites uh, was by distributing half shekels and in the end you see how many half shekels you distributed and you say okay this is the number of the host of Israel but unless the Lord commands you to number the host of Israel you are not supposed to command them because you are someone who doesn't care about how many people you have the Lord is the one who sustains you but David again sins there is a punishment but the punishment is is uh, effects are limited because David repents and offers sacrifices and acknowledges the Lord and offers burnt offerings. And so the plague is stayed from Israel. And this is the book of 2 Samuel in a nutshell. It's, it's an intriguing book. There is lots of little nuggets in it, but my favorites are, my, my favorites are the story of Uzzah uh, and the general theme uh, of the Lord is David's source of strength. This is the sort of my 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 best parts in, in this book. Now, the in the next episode, I will talk about the waning days of David and the rise of Solomon, his son, with more intrigue. And once we have studied David and Solomon, then we will go into the reign of kings. Uh, of over Judah and Israel and the separation between the two kingdoms uh, and the what we can learn from these stories that seem to be pure history but they're not uh, a pattern is in them that's supposed to teach us something and thank you for watching and bearing with me thank you and have a nice time